Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's very loud. Sorry. If you're not awake, you are now. Welcome. My name is Adolf. I am the director of student ministries here. We're glad that you could be with us. And morning to those uh, folks streaming online or Tony waving as I he's operating you said the screaming camera. Screaming online. Screaming right online. No, streaming. Streaming. Live streaming. Got it. Okay. Although you could be screaming. I don't know. <laughs> Speaking of screaming, not really. But awkward transition. We have these Connect cards. If you are new here, they're conveniently located in the seat back in front of you. Uh, if you guys would fill those out, we can help get you connected to what God is doing here uh, through our, our church. And I am Amy. I am the Kids Co. Director. And speaking of Kids Co., we are coming up on summer. And summer is a time where we run things a little bit differently in Kids Co. So we are looking for some help. We have amazing people that help us out throughout the school year, but come summer, we try to give them a little bit of a break so that they can re-energize and refocus. Um, so that's where we're asking for some extra help. We need some extra help with our kids' code to run over summer. Um, so we're asking for you to consider two or three services over summer. Um, and when you sign up, it's a service, so you can attend the second service if you would like. Um, but how we're gonna run it is through stations. So chances are you'll have a station that you're in charge of. And so it's kind of a low risk way to come in and see what we're doing in Kids Co. Um, but we're gonna need that help in order to help run Kids Co this summer. Um, so if you've ever had reservations in the past about serving, like I said, this is kind of a fun, easy way to just come and see what's going on. Um, everything is prep for you. So when you come, there's no prep that you have to do beforehand. It's just simply reading through 
the lesson that you'd be in charge of that day. So please consider this so that we can run our kids' co how we would like and make sure that our kids are loved on this summer. If you have any questions, I'll be in the back in the lobby um, after service. Yeah, I will also be in the back in the lobby after service uh, selling these cool t-shirts. So we are sending our kids to camp and this is one of our fundraisers. Today is the last day to purchase a shirt. Uh, so again, I'll be in the back at our table selling these shirts. Um, we're also gonna have an informational meeting, whether you are registered for camp already or need some more information before you decide to do that. We're gonna have an informational meeting for you June 12th after each service. It will be in here uh, for about 15, 20 minutes and hopefully we'll get all your questions answered and help get you registered if you're not already registered for camp. And also today is the last day to sign up with Dinner for Friends. So family and food are two values that we have here at SBC. And so this is a combination of those two. Um, so if that's something that you're interested, it is Friday, June 3rd and Saturday, June 4th. Um, you can sign up for either one of those two days. Um, but there's host families that's going to be having people over, having some food, some dinner together. So sign up through the Church Center app. Like I said, today is the last day to sign up for that. You can sign up for both and get free meals with friends I mean, back to back days. If you really value food, I guess that's one yeah. way to do it. One of our other values, joking aside, uh, is missions. Uh, and we believe in just uh, advancing the kingdom of God. And so we are going to be sending Tim Jacobson and Scott Carolyn uh, to the Congo. So we're going to invite Scott up to give you guys some more information as to what they're going to be doing there. Yeah, you can clap. Thank you, Amy. Yeah, so um, we're entering back into a time where we can start taking trips overseas again. And so we're hoping to begin to build partnerships with different missions organizations and countries so that we can start sending, hopefully, teams from SBC and our, and our body to go international and experience what God's doing there. And so on this particular trip, uh, a week from today, Tim Jacobson and I will be on a plane headed to Congo. We are going with an organization called KFC. And I, it's not the chicken, I promise you. We're not going to be eating fried chicken while we're there. Um, it's Kalungu for Congo, and so Doug, a friend of mine who is Congolese, has been doing work over there for many years, and so we're going to be visiting a bunch of villages where they are planting churches, they're building schools, they're um, digging wells, um, and working on agricultural stuff. So Tim and I are going to go and kind of get the lay of the land and see what God's doing and how we might be able to partner with them in Congo and maybe bring some of you in the future. And so, yeah, we're really excited about it. It's kind of a scouting trip for us. And so if you could be praying for us, that would be awesome. Obviously for safe travels and health while we're there. Uh, neither Tim or I want to get malaria if we can avoid it at all costs. And so that would be great. Um, also for us just to be open to what God's doing and have eyes to see it would be awesome. And then just pray for our families, my wife and Tim's wife as we're gone. And my wife's trying to hold down the fort with five kids, you know, so... She's actually got that's the harder job. Congo's a piece of cake compared to that. So <laughs> that's a mission in itself. So, all right. Well, let's pray for you now. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, God, you were already moving and, and working uh, in the Congo, and you've just invited uh, us to be a part of that um, through Tim and, and through Scott. And so we ask that you would um, just bless this, uh, this journey, this trip, uh, with safe travels and in good health, uh, Lord, that you would open our eyes to uh, the possibilities of, of advancing your kingdom and, and, and growing your kingdom, of loving on your people well and just uh, serving you and, and glorifying you and, and all that we do. We lift up to you, uh, Jane and, and Becky and, and the kids, and uh, God, that you would just uh, bless them as uh, their spouses go away, uh, that we as a, as a church would come alongside and, and help support them uh, here at home. And we just uh, bless you and, and praise you for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, we can't wait to see uh, just what you're going to do uh, through this um, through this trip. We love you, Lord, and it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Promise maker. Promise maker.
deserve. You see it through till the end. You see it through. You see it through till the end. See the Lord our God. Lord our God is ever faithful, never changing through the ages. From this darkness, you will lead us, and forever we will say, you're the Lord. to worship the Lord together. Before we sing and worship our Lord in this next song, we would like to share a verse with you. It comes from 2 Corinthians. So it's 2 Corinthians 8, 9, and it reads, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. And as we sing all the poor and powerless, I pray that our hearts meditate not only on the song, but on this verse as well.
I'm Sean. If I look familiar, I'm sometimes a greeter, um, and uh, I'm going to read um, Esther chapter 4. This is what pa Pastor Pete's going to preach on today. When Mordecai learned that all had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on, a, put on sackcloth and ashes, and he went out into the midst of the city, and he cried with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the king's gate. For no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every 
province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting and weeping and lamenting. Many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's young women and her eunuchs came to her and told her, the queen was very distressed. She sent garments to, to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called for Haddish, one of the king's eunuchs, who had been appointed to attend her, and he ordered him to go to Mordecai to learn what, what, was, what this was and why it was. Haddish went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city, in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the exact sum of money that Haman had promised to pay for the king's tre from the king into the king's treasury for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for their destruction, that he might show it to Esther and explain to her and command her to go to the king to beg for his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Haddish went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. Then Esther spoke to Haddish and commanded him to go to Mordecai and say, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that if any man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, there is but one law to be put to death, except the one to whom God holds out the golden scepter so that he may live. Excuse me, the king holds out to the golden scepter that he may live. But as for me, I have been called to come in to the king these 30 days. And they told Mordecai what Esther had said. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think of yourself in the king's palace. You will escape any more than all the other Jews. For, for if you keep silent at this time, re relief and deliverance for the Jews um, will rise from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. And Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Good morning. My name is Pete. We get to hang out here this morning. We're going to be in Esther chapter 4. Uh, please turn to Esther, Esther chapter 4 if you need a Bible. They're passing out Bibles. Uh, if you have a phone, if you would like to go on your phone, Esther chapter 4. It would help you better understand that, uh, my message today, uh, what God will say, if you follow along in the text. And so um, those are the cheat notes. Follow the text, and it will tell you where we're going at this morning. It is so good that we exist here at Sanger Bible to help you uh, love God and love people. And so uh, we are honored that you are joining us here this morning, whether in person uh, or for those on, who are online. If you're checking us out online, please send me an email. We'd love to buy you coffee. My, my email is p at sangerbible.com. Uh, for our Sunday gatherings, uh, we typically pick a book in the Bible and then we make, way, make our way through the book of the Bible verse by verse. And so if you're joining us, we are in week four of the book of Esther. And this morning, we're going to continue to unpack this crazy, interesting story in which we see God's perfect work through imperfect people. Have you ever wondered why God, uh, what God's will is? Have you ever wondered what God's will is? At the most basic understanding, God's will is repenting of our sin and trusting in Jesus. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 gives us a sweet picture of, of, of this. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what, the, what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. There's a sequence in this text. It's essentially saying, as believers, when we refuse to be conformed to this world and are transformed by the Holy Spirit, as our minds are being renewed according to the things of God, in that and only in that, we will know God's perfect will. Typically, we think of God's will in the big scheme of things. Is it God's will for me to go to school here? Is it God's will for me to, to live here or move 
Is it God's will for me to, to take this job or not? Is it God's will for me to marry or not to, be, to not get married? Those are great questions as we seek God's will, but more often than not, we forget about God's will in our thoughts, with our words, the tone we use. When we serve others, God's will applies to all of that. So far in the story of Esther, every single person has chosen their way over God's will. King Xerxes, he's the self-absorbed, addicted to sex and, and alcohol, narcissistic king. Haman, the Agagites, he's King Xerxes' right-hand man. This guy is power-hungry, and he just uses his power to abuse people. Mordecai, the Jew, remember how he should have went back to the promised land, but he chose to stay in Persia. He assimilated into the culture. He compromised his faith. Esther, also the Jew, but a queen. She's married to a pagan now, completely breaking the law of the Jewish people. And now she's living comfortably in this pagan empire. And so not once, not once in this whole story has any character lived out God's will, not once. When we left off last week, Haman got his way with the king. Remember how he talked, King Xerxes says, hey, there's a, there's a group of people that's living in your provinces. Yeah, they, they don't worship you. They worship a different king. They don't listen to you. They listen to their God. They don't obey you. We should just mass genocide, murder them all. And the king says, you know what, that's a good idea. So he creates this decree, this mass genocide, and it goes out. And this comes about because Mordecai the Jew refused to bow down to Haman. So this decree goes out. Yet even in this decree, even in all three chapters going into chapter 4, with all the mess, all the ruins that we see here, you still see God at work. Esther and Mordecai are right where God needs them to be. Esther is the queen of Persia. And Mordecai, remember in chapter 1 and 2, Mordecai was able to go to the king's courts. Last week we saw in chapter 3, he was able to go into the king's gates. He was promoted. We don't know what role, but God at work was able to make this happen. So what we see here so far is Mordecai and Esther are right where God needs them to be. Yet here's my question for us today. Will they continue to hide and do what's easy? Or will they choose God's will? And that's the application that we're going to ask ourselves today. We're going to ask, like, at the end of our time today, are we, are we going to do, live out his will or are we going to choose ours? And I hope you're in for a ride today. There's going to be some hard things that's going to be said. But at the end of our time today, man, my hope and my prayer is that God will be made much in our room today. I don't know, but the songs that we just did before today was just, whoo. I thought I was going to like, let's do it again. You know? So good. I can feel the Holy Spirit already at work among us. So let's dive in. Esther chapter 4. Let's begin. Verse 1. When Mordecai learned all that had been done, Mordecai tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes. And he went out into the midst of the city and he cried with a loud and bitter cry. He went up to the entrance of the, the king's gate, for no one was allowed to enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. So just a little backstory. Mordecai and his family have chosen to stay in Persia where it was comfortable. They've assimilated into the culture. They were allowed to go back to the promised land, but they didn't. And so now they live among the Persians and they act, they look and live like the Persians. But now there's this decree that all Jews will be killed. And Mordecai responds in this way. And it's interesting. He responds with sackcloth and ashes. You see, sackcloth and ashes is this outward um, expression of repentance. Folks would wear sackcloth, which is itchy and, and scratchy and rough and, and painful. They would wear this to show that they're willing to be uncomfortable expressing their sorrow for what was done. While in their sackcloth, they then would sit in ashes and put ashes on their forehead. Ashes represented death. 
And so this was a death to their very actions. And so the sackcloth and ashes is this outward experience that, of a repentant, remorseful heart. Mordecai's heartbroken over his actions. My question, though, which ones? Is, is, he, is he repenting that, that he assimilated into the culture? Or is he repenting that he bowed down to Haman? I would say Mordecai finally, finally realizes that he has been choosing to do what's best for him and not God's will. I think it clicked in Mordecai's head that, that he has hid his faith in the Persian culture, that he's been lazy about his faith. I think he understands that he's has sinned towards God. And now because of his actions, like he doesn't bow down to Haman. And because of that, the Jews are going to be murdered. And so Mordecai here is lamenting. He's in sackcloth and ashes. He's grieving his sins, showing God, like I'm repenting. I'm remorseful. Like I'm, I'm messed up. I messed up, God. Not only does Mordecai do this, look at verse 3. And in every province, wherever the king's command and his decree reached, there was great mourning among the Jews with fasting and weeping, lamenting many of them lay in sackcloth and ashes. All the Jews all over were doing the same. Look at verse 4. When Esther's young women and her eunuchs came and told her, the queen was deeply distressed. She sent garments to clothe Mordecai so that he might take off his sackcloth, but he would not accept. <clears throat> Esther hears about what Mordecai is doing, and so she's concerned about him, which makes sense. So what does she do? She sends clothes with her servants to clothe him. Again, I, I like to ask questions about what's going on here. I'm like, why does she send clothes why, why, why does she do this? Does, does she not understand what's, what's happening here? A couple of things we, 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 gotta, um, we need to see and understand here. Number one, she's disconnected from reality. And number two is her lack of understanding of the moment. You see, since chapter three to chapter four, it's been a couple of years now. She's been a queen for a, for a handful of years now. And so she's been disconnected from the general public. Like she's been in her castle, hidden away from, from, from everybody. She's been with her, her servants, her young women, her, her eunuchs. And because of that, like she has no idea what's going on. Look at verse five. Then Esther called Hathach, one of the king's eunuchs who'd been appointed to attend to her and ordered him to go to Mordecai and learn what this was and why it was. And Hathach, verse 6, went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. So she's clueless, but she hears about Mordecai, but she has no idea what's going on. And so it's like, hey, can, can somebody go find out? Can somebody go find out? What's interesting is the, the whole sackcloth and ashes, that in and of itself, that should have given her some sort of like red flag, like, ooh, something's happening my uncle Mordecai is in sackcloth and ashes. Like, what, what did he do? He's repenting right now. But that's not her instinctual, that's not her first reaction. Her first reaction is to clothe him, to, to stop drawing attention to yourself. You're going to get yourself hurt. How Esther is responding to Mordecai's repentance is, is telling It's telling, it's showing us how Mordecai raised her. It's telling his lack of discipleship. Like how she responds tells us that she wasn't raised up in the faith. Like I get it though, Mordecai and his family have chosen to do what's easy, have chosen to do what's comfortable, they've adapted into the culture, they've integrated themselves in the, in the Persian culture. So she grew up around folks who were hiding their faith. Did Mordecai outwardly speak against God to Esther? Did he point her away from God on purpose? I don't think so. But one thing we forget all the time is our actions speak louder than words. You see, more often than not, our kids catch. They catch 
life lessons, life experiences. They catch our, our, you know, just our attitude. They catch our values. They're never taught it. They just catch it. And so I'm sure Esther learned a lot by watching, growing up, watching her aunt, uncles, her relatives, her, the other Jews around, turning the blind eye, people pleasing, hiding their faith. And so how Esther was responding to to Mordecai isn't a surprise. So look at what Mordecai says in verse 7. Mordecai told all that had happened to him, the exact sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries for the destruction of the Jews. Mordecai, verse 8, also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa for the destruction that he might, sh- might show it to Esther and explain it to her. So Esther is really given a rundown. It's like, hey, could you explain this to Esther? Here's proof. Here's what's happening. Here's how much money Haman took. Can you show this to her? Explain it to her. But then he says this at the rest of the, look at the rest of verse 8. And he commanded her to go to the king to beg his favor and plead with him on behalf of her people. And Hathach went and told Esther what Mordecai had said. So not only is like, hey, here's proof, but hey, here's a, here's a command. Like Mordecai, I, I, I want you to, uh, Esther, I want you to do something crazy. I'm, I'm hoping you use your position as a queen now to, with, with the king to, to stop this decree. Then Esther responds. Look back at verse 10. Then Esther spoke with Hathach and commanded to go to Mordecai and said, All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces, they know that if a man or woman goes to the king inside the inner court without being called, without being invited, essentially, there is but one law to be put to death. Except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter so that he might may live. But as for me, I've not been called to come into the king these 30 days. And they told Mordecai, and Esther, what Esther had said. So essentially, you step back and you look, it was like, okay, Esther has two options. She can continue to stay disconnected, to pretend that she's not a Jew, and just kind of live up in her castle and do nothing to stop the mass genocide. Or she could reveal who she is, risk her life, and go talk to the king to keep the Jews alive. Those are her two options. God's will or ours? What's comfortable for us or what's honoring to Christ? Those are her two options. Look at verse 13. Then Mordecai told them to reply to Esther, Do not think of yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the other Jews. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place but you and your father's house will perish. Ooh. Now, this is interesting. This is a, you, 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 what you see here is Mordecai. Mordecai is turning the corner, and he's trying to disciple now Esther. He's saying, hey, I don't, don't think for a moment that because you're away in this palace, that you will escape when all the Jews are killed. Sure, you can keep quiet. I'm paraphrasing here. But death's going to come. Who knows? Maybe, maybe you were made queen for such a time as this. You see what Mordecai is doing? I love what Mordecai is doing here. You see, he's helping Esther see the temptation that he's wrestled with for years. You see, the temptation that he's given into for years. For years, he has, he has hid and chose what was safe. For years, he has compromised his faith and it integrated himself into the culture around him. For years, he has chosen his will over God's will. So he tells Esther, don't be like me. Don't be like me. I'm a coward. I've hidden away. Don't do what I've done for years. Nothing. And he tells Esther, be and do what God has created you to be. Maybe he put you in this very position 
to choose his will. Don't be like me. And that you see the temptation there. God's will or hers? Xerxes' kingdom or the kingdom of God? Will she do what's easy, comfortable for her, what she's always seen growing up, or will she do what's hard and difficult for God? Do you notice uh, Mordecai's memory? Notice his memory. Look, it says, uh, I think it's verse 14. If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. He's, he's, he's inserting, it was like, man, I know that our God, that the God that I've been hiding from, the God that I've been punting, the God that I've compromised from, I know his promises. I know how his providence works. He has a promise that from us, a seed, a savior is going to come. So I know deliverance is going to come. It's going to happen. That's why he goes on to say, and who knows whether you have not come to this kingdom for such a time as this. Man, Mordecai is saying, so why not you, Esther? Why not you? Why why don't you do what's God honoring? Mordecai tells Esther, what if? What if you were placed right here? What what if this was the reason why you were placed on this earthly Persian kingdom so that through you, you would be able to keep God's promise to bring forth his kingdom? What will she choose, God's will or hers? Let's look at verse 15. Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, go gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my young woman will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Verse 17, Mordecai then went away and did everything as Esther had ordered him. Esther determines to risk her life for the sake of the people. Esther chooses to honor God no matter what. Esther decides to trust in the promises of God through Mordecai. Man, his persistence here. He pushes her to see. I wonder if he was like, man, I have messed up all these years. But do not mess us up, Esther. God is going to work through you. I've seen it all my life, but I've ignored it all my life. Esther, don't miss out on this. And you see Esther. She gets it. It's his will, not hers. So she tells Mordecai, go tell everyone, family, everyone. Tell them to fast on my behalf. Her and her inner group, they're going to fast. Tell everybody else to fast. And because she has chosen God's will over hers, she has the strength to say, if I perish, I perish. Church, there's a good chance that none of us are facing this kind of decision this morning. But every day we face the choice, his will or mine. Every day. Every day we have the question, we'll wake up, his will or mine? Am I going to seek what's comfortable and easy? Am I not going to do what's comfortable and easy? I'll just go on my phone. I'll just go on porn. That's easy. That's comfortable. Or are we going to do what's honoring to Christ? And when we go on the phone, we'll have integrity. You see, look at Mordecai. Up until this very point, he has chosen what has been comfortable, what has been easy. He has hid his faith. He's blended right into the Persian culture. His discipling of Esther completely failed. Like instead of raising her to know God, to know her roots, he has led her away from her roots and allowed her to be the queen of Persia. But, but even in the messed up things this year, God works through imperfect people. We see in our text today, Mordecai finally chooses God's will and he repents. He repents. He says, God, I messed up. Hear me. See me. I messed up. Forgive me. 
And then look at Esther. She was disconnected from reality. She was cut off from her people. She was living the life, this comfortable life. Yet she hears about this decree. Mordecai casts vision with her, helps her see, and faces the question, his will or, or his, uh, her will or his? This is the very question every single one of us answer, intentionally or unintentionally. We will answer this question. We'll answer it as we leave. We'll answer it in about two hours. We'll answer it later on tonight. We'll answer it tomorrow morning. His will or ours. When we get on the phone later on. Porn or have integrity. In our discussions, am I going to gossip or I'm going to uplift others? With our mind, am I going to do some gymnastic assumptions? Or will I think of the best of others? In our relationships, will I, will I do my best to honor God with it? Or am I going to compromise and we're just all going to like dive into sin together? Without time, am I, am I going to serve others or be lazy with my talents? Am I going to use it for his kingdom or for my own gain? And without treasures, will I honor God or will I spend it on what I want? Every day, every situation, you and I are going to answer the question, his will or ours? There's a couple of applications here. There's an immediate application. And then there's this application where we step back and look at the text and like look at the big picture of this. And so first and foremost, the immediate application of this text is, I firmly believe with the power of the work, the work of the Holy Spirit in us here today, I firmly believe that we have chosen God, our will over God's will. And so today, I think we need to repent. I think we need to confess. And I, th- and I say we, it's because all of us, like some of us have chosen to hide our faith. Just like Mordecai and Esther did, we look more like the culture. We have compromised our faith. We believe in Jesus. We have hell insurance. But our lives look nothing what Jesus has called us to live. Like the only way people know us that we're Christian is is we wear a Christian t-shirt. Like if this is you, you have to confess and repent. Some of us have chosen the comfortable lifestyle. Remember how Mordecai and his family have chosen to stay in Persia instead of go back? Some of us choose to do what's easy. Like we, have, we are choosing to do what's easy. And if there's any kind of sacrifice required, we're like deuces. We can't be there. Sorry. Serious. When it comes to serving, giving, loving others, talking to strangers, we only do it because we're chosen what's comfortable. We only do it when it fits our schedule. Or when it's stress-free. Like if this is you, you need to repent. You need to confess of this. Now, when you take those things, here's the thing. This is the, the, the hard part right here. When you take those two things, the hiding of the faith and us choosing the comfortable lifestyle, the very fruit that has come out of this is we have discipled our children, the next generation, the very way Mordecai has discipled Esther. Like as a group, as, as the group here in the United States, as Christians in the United States, when it comes to discipling our children, we are failing. 70%, over 70% are leaving the faith when they graduate high school. Over 70%, over 70% are leaving the church. Sure, like I get it. The world out there is dark. The world out there is filled with sin. But let's not shift the blame here. It's easy. It's comfortable to be like, the world's messy. The world's dark. The world's filled with sin. All the while, we have sucked at following Jesus. The reason why students leave is because, like, mom and dad ain't different. Mom and dad is not different. Why am I going to follow their God when I can go do the same in the world? And that's because we've hidden our faith. And that's because we've chosen what's comfortable. And so they watch us. They watch us live. 
And you know how I said earlier that more is caught than taught? More is caught. Our kids watch us. And so we need to confess, church. We need to repent. Luke chapter 5 reads, verse 32, says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repent. May we repent today. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And that's the immediate application. I hope you challenge in that, that we will repent and confess. Now, as we step back and look at this holistically, kind of the big scheme of things, what we saw today in the text is God at work through imperfect people, through Mordecai and Esther. Like, even in their messed up sins, God is at work. And likewise, for us, God has you right where he wants you to be, where you live, where you work, and where you play, even in your, even in your mind, like, I'm a sinner, Pete, right there, right there, God has you right where he wants you to be. Like, even if you think, I'm not even good enough, how's God going to use me? God has you right where he wants you to bring, which is going to bring him glory. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Like, God has created us specifically for good works in which he has prepared beforehand that we shall walk in them. So wherever you live, wherever you work, wherever you play, no matter, no matter your life, no matter how you sin, no matter how broken you are, God has put you in there to use you to bring him glory. No matter the ruins that are happening in your life, he's going to take all of that and he's like, no, I got this. I'm going to bring glory to God. And so if you're married, you are there for your spouse. If you, are, if you have kids, you are there to disciple them. If you're single, the relationships, your nieces and nephews, you are there as Christians We are all placed in the very place we live, work, and play to bring him glory. For some of us, it's those who can't speak. For some of us, it's those who are hungry. For some of us, it's those who don't have a home. And for some of us, it's those who uh, have no family. But for all of us, through all those avenues... We are all there because they're all broken spiritually. And we know the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Church, I know that living out God's will is hard. I know for a fact that God's will is difficult. But I also know it's the best. The best. I tell people, people have asked me, even somebody asked me this week, hey, tell me when, when you knew you wanted to be a pastor. And so essentially they're asking, hey, like, tell me how you knew that that was God's will for you. And I tell them, man, I'm still kicking and screaming. <laughs> if a better opportunity came about, man, I am on that. But there is no life, no better life found outside of God's will. And so you may be kicking and screaming. You may be broken. You may be like, God, take me. I have no idea what, how you're going to use me. But what God's going to do is he was like, I got you. It's okay because it's, it's all going to be me doing all the work through you. And so even though we're kicking and screaming to be in God's will, when we're in God's will, there is no other life we would rather live. And that's the life that our children need to see. That's the life that our world needs to see, that God has such an impact that I'm not the same from 20 years ago when I graduated high school. That's the world has to see from us, and that's what's happening to Mordecai and Esther, despite their actions, despite how horrific their actions are. God took everything that what we see is just a bunch of ruins. He took it and he glorified it to him. 
God used their actions to further his will. God used their actions to keep their promise. God used them to bring glory through their ruins. So we do need to confess and repent. But I also want you to raise your eyes up higher and answer the question, what if? What if God has you right where he wants you to be? How does he want you to further his kingdom? Easy. Choose his will over ours. Let's pray. Jesus, I pray and I lift up to you the next few minutes as your church, as believers here, just confess and repent how we have fumbled have we have compromised? Have we have hidden our faith? Have we, have we have not been Christ-like in our relationships at work with our neighbors? Maybe with our children. Holy Spirit, I ask that you draw us closer to you. We know in scripture that you say you are faithful and just when we confess, so I pray and I expect that from you here, Holy Spirit, that you'll meet us right where we're at. Jesus, I also pray that you remind us through the Holy Spirit that we are right where you want us to be, to use us, to bring glory to you. And so whatever that decision is here today, I know there's folks here today, they have to choose. There's some big things in their lives right now where they have to choose your will or theirs. No matter how difficult it may be, no matter how hard it may be, I pray that they see that honoring you is the best thing to do. Holy Spirit, give them the strength to do that. I also ask for the strength for the little things. Our thoughts, our words, our time on our phones. I I pray that your strength will lead us to do your will in those little moments. We pray this in your name. Amen. When the mountains fall and the tempest roars, you are with me. When creation folds, still my soul will soar on your mercy. And I walk through the fire.
Our world needs Jesus. And so I pray that as we leave here today, I, I pray that the Holy Spirit's just reminding you. It's like, I know that the world we live in, there's all these sorts of things, there's the nuances. And I'm a football player, and so like, I want to teach my kids football. But if I teach them football and not Jesus, I've failed. There's all sorts of things that, that we get sucked into. I get it, I get it, I get it. But can we, can we leave here today? And when we sing this song that we'll shout it out, could we, could we do it with more than just words? With our actions. So I hope and I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit's at work today, that he brought up some things that are like, oh man, I got, yes, Jesus, I'm repenting of that. That's not going to happen in my life. And that's true. Let's go. Let's go. The world needs Jesus. And it's time we stop hiding. It's time we stop being comfortable. Let's go. Let's go be the church. Esther chapter 5 next Sunday. See you guys. Have a great Sunday. Be the church. We'll see you guys next week.